they are ready to roll. I've got some really exciting And I promise you, we will be rolling. Amen. So, oh, yeah. excited about that tonight. A number of years ago, I was preaching in Hawaii and uh, visited the USS uh, Missouri Memorial and uh, this is a famous ship from World War II. And uh, it's there, uh, you can take a guided tour of it, and we did. And a number of his speeches are listed there. And it was in, uh, on September 2nd, 1945, uh, not when I was there, because that's way before I was born. But on September 2nd, 1945, Douglas MacArthur, General Douglas MacArthur, made a radio address to the American people off of that ship uh, in the Bay of Tokyo in Japan. And that was the day that uh, uh, the Japanese uh, surrendered to America in World War II. This speech that he made, I encourage you to read it. It's not very long at all, just a couple of pages. It's a speech filled with faith and future and hope. How many know tonight we need some faith, we need some future, and we need some hope? And we have that tonight in the house of God. But what's interesting is buried in the middle of that speech were some very prophetic words, words that were written in 1945 that speak to you and I today that are also going to speak to the future should Jesus give us more time. And he made this statement. I want to read it to you. It's about a paragraph and a half, two paragraphs. And he's making this speech in the Bay of Tokyo. He says, we have had our last chance. If we do not now devise some greater and more equitable system, Armageddon will be at our door at the end of the world. The problem basically is theological and involves a spiritual improvement of human character that will synchronize with our almost matchless advances in science and art and literature and material and cultural development over the past 2,000 years. And he closes with this statement. He says, it must be the spirit if we're going to save the flesh. These words are true 74 years later today. We can look at it in the day and age that you and I live in. Warfare has not ceased, uh, and Armageddon uh, is at the end, uh, or still at our door. And I was struck by the phrase that he uh, uh, mentioned in that speech, and I underlined it in my message. He says, the problem basically is theological. That's interesting for a general to make that speech uh, in 1945 uh, via radio to the people of the United States of America. And so there is uh, some issues tonight in the world we live in. How many know that tonight? What causes hatred between nations? What causes hatred between races uh, and cultures? Uh, and uh, as many of you know, uh, all of us that are gathered here tonight probably would not have functioned well together in the world without Jesus Christ. Uh, and we understand this evening, uh, for that matter, uh, why do marriages break up? Why do families fall apart? Why do churches split? The problem is basically theological. People attack one another because we have abandoned God. We hate each other because we don't respect the Ten Commandments anymore. When we were painting the back walls there in the Fellowship Hall room, uh, we were going to paint every single wall. Uh, and uh, I, I believe it was Sister Mary LeBlanc that said, uh, you know what, uh, can you leave the Ten Commandments section up on the wall there? And I said, absolutely, we're going to leave that up there. And the reason that we uh, don't like one another anymore is because we don't respect God's word. <laughs> we speak evil, talk trash against one another because we think we know better than God does. And that's the problem of Genesis chapter 1 is Adam and Eve, they wanted to be like God, uh, so they thought they knew better than God. Hebrews chapter 11 tonight is the hall of fame of faith. And I want to minister, open your Bibles to Hebrews uh, chapter 11. We're going to read verse number 1, but I want you to stay in there. I'm not going to keep you along tonight, but I want to power through this this evening because I really need some help tonight in the house of God. Hebrews 11, verse number 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I want to minister a sermon I've entitled, Who Will Be the Next Hero? 
So this chapter, over and over again, it speaks about faith. Uh, we understand that tonight. Uh, it defines faith by describing it how it works. Uh, people always want to know how faith actually works. Uh, and we're going to look at that this evening, and I'm going to define it along with you, uh, and with a few, maybe a half a dozen or more descriptions uh, on faith for us to think about tonight, because uh, people so readily and so easily detach from their faith. Uh, it seems like one super negative circumstance or, or one chain of events or someone tells them no uh, or the job didn't come through uh, or the guy doesn't like you uh, or the girl doesn't like you, you didn't get the ministry, you didn't get the promotion, whatever it may be. And it seems like our faith uh, is cast aside. But God loves the people who dare to trust him tonight. When I grew up, I had trust issues. I don't want to trust a lot of people. I only wanted to trust those that I hang out with, uh, that I ran with at those times. Uh, and so uh, I thought it served me well. Uh, but if you take those issues where you have a hard time trusting people into your adult life, uh, and worse, into your Christian life, uh, you know what? You're going to be the same person uh, you've always been. Uh, and faith tonight, if you're taking notes, uh, always involves the unseen. That refers to the faith of our first text, our first uh, scripture there, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Um, by faith, we see what the world cannot deceive. See, you need discernment tonight. What's discernment this evening? Uh, literally, discernment is the ability to see life for what it really is. To be able to understand what it's like. To look through a cloudy circumstance uh, and to be able to decipher uh, what's right uh, and what's wrong. That's discernment this evening because faith always involves uh, the unseen things of God. Uh, the world says tonight, uh, seeing is believing. <coughs> Excuse me. God says believing is seeing tonight. We believe, uh, therefore we see. I don't want to see some things happen. I want to see some things happen. Uh, in order to do that tonight, uh, somewhere uh, I've got to exercise my faith, uh, and my faith uh, causes me to see things uh, and make things happen. Faith tonight wins God's approval. When I grew up, all I wanted was my dad's approval. I just wanted him to say, job well done, good job son, proud of you. All those things I wanted from my dad, and thank goodness my dad uh, uh, was like that, and he told me that. Uh, but how much more so tonight? Uh, you want approval from someone? Hey, listen, girls, uh, you don't need approval uh, from the latest Mac Daddy guy that's around here. You don't need that kind of approval tonight. The approval that you want this evening is God's approval. And faith uh, will win God's approval. This refers to the Old Testament heroes uh, <clears throat> who trusted God. Uh, in verse number 2, it speaks about that. When we have Pastor Stacy Dillard preach, uh, he'll often say, Can I get a witness? What's he looking for? He's looking for an amen. Amen simply means uh, we agree. In Chinese, it's the word called momento e, which means I really do agree. Only in verse number 2 and in Hebrews 11, God is doing the witnessing and not you and I. When Moses stood up for righteousness, when David slew Goliath, when Ruth said, your people will be my people and your God will be my God. When Elijah defeated the prophets of Baal and God looked down from heaven, it's like God said, amen, my son. Amen, my daughter. When you say no to the mad daddy, it's like God would say, well done, young lady. When you say, I'm not going to go to the club or the bar, I'm not going to get high anymore. <laughs> when Mary Jane stood there in her lunchroom area at Chandler High, scared out of her mind to begin to preach, and when she began to preach, God says, well done. Oh, yeah. Because faith Amen. brings God's approval tonight, uh, and that's ultimately what I want. Uh, I want God to approve uh, of me. Uh, that's my son. <clears throat> that's my daughter. 
Ruth mentioned her. Things looked really bad for Ruth. But the mercy of God worked out all things for her. Listen, God will work out the future for you and I as well tonight. Because God loves it when His people dare to trust Him. This is why during conference week we can do 17 church plans because our pastor dares to trust God for all things. God loves it when His people dare to trust Him. The other area is faith gains acceptance with God. That would be like when Abel, who offered a better sacrifice, you can read it on your own in verse number 4 of chapter Hebrews 11, that God accepted his sacrifice. Uh, jealousy caused his brother Cain to murder him, but note this, both Cain and Abel were religious men. It's not religion that God wants. He never wanted a, 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 a blood, a, the animal blood to fill the streets as payment for sin. Uh, <clears throat> what really mattered to God uh, it was the faith behind the sacrifice. You can bring a great offering into God's house tonight, but if there's no faith behind it, God won't accept it. Because faith gains acceptance with God. God always looks to the heart first and foremost. We know man, we look to the outer appearance. That's true. We want to see how people look on the outside. Faith also pleases God tonight. That would be Enoch, chapter, in verse, chapter 11, verse number 5 to 6. At the age of 65, he began to walk with God when his son Methuselah was born. And I was thinking about this. He's 65 years of age. Methuselah is born. Uh, and like a lot of dads, uh, he probably didn't get serious in his Christian faith, faith uh, until he began to hold his child for the very first time. <laughs> I've seen uh, men uh, uh, just live a crazy life. Uh, and even as Christian men, uh, sometimes uh, live in a life where they are not sanctified. They're not set apart. They're not all in yet. They haven't pushed all the chips uh, onto the board. But somehow, when you hold your first child, uh, there should be something inside of you. Uh, you feel the weight of responsibility. Perhaps that's what happened to Enoch. In any case, he walked with God for 300 years. Years. You want to talk about old school? That's old school. 300 years uh, he walked with God. One day, Enoch and God had walked so far together, God said, why don't you come home with me? Think about that. He never tasted death. He never tasted the grave. He walked with God for so long that God says, why don't you come home with me? Listen, long-standing church member, walking for God over the long haul makes a big difference because one day God is going to say, you know what, sister? You know what, uh, brother? Uh, why don't you come home uh, and be with me? Longevity counts in the house of God. Uh, you may be 50, 60, 70, 80 years of age here. Uh, uh, listen, uh, what you do in those years makes a difference. Walk with God. And Enoch walked beyond space and time into eternity. Faith tonight saves your family. That would be Noah, and that's the reference in Hebrews chapter 11, build an ark uh, to a people that had never seen rain before. He preached righteousness to a generation that cared nothing about what he had to say. When the world around him we know was going to hell, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So he built the ark and he saved his family. Take message and heart from Noah's example. You can be godly in a very ungodly world. That's true. You know, let's stop complaining how jacked up the world is. We know how jacked up it is. Yeah, it is. In his time, he they had eight people living for God. Eight. Yeah, eight. Yeah, that's, right. that's it. And they were really messed up. We have far more spiritual advantage uh, 
than Noah had. Uh, all we need is the courage uh, to do what Noah did and believe what God has said uh, because faith tonight will save your family. You need an exercise of faith. <clears throat> Excuse me. Faith steps out and never looks back. This would be Abraham. This is for all of you that have been around for a little bit, but you still got some gas in the tank. Abraham left the Ur of the Chaldees as a prosperous, middle-aged businessman who heard the voice of God, uh, and he departed for lands unknown. That's verses 8 through 10. Uh, you know, living for God is no guarantee of a long life and great success. You may have those things, uh, or you may not. But it's still good enough for me whether I attain it in this life or, or not. Uh, because living by faith means stepping out for God and leaving the results to Him. Somewhere we have to trust Him with every single aspect of our life. Because remember the title tonight is, Who Will Be the Next Hero? Hebrews 11 is the heroes and the hall of fame uh, of faith. The life of faith tonight means I'm going to be the man or woman God wants me to be, no matter where it leads. I don't know the future. I'm going to trust Him to work out the details. In the meantime, I'm going to live by faith. Faith tonight also believes what it sees in the distance. This is critical if you're going to live for God. You have to have the ability to see where God can possibly take you. You have to have the ability to see that God does have a very unique plan for you and I. It's kind of like the Old Testament believers. Of, this is in verses 13 through 16. Kind of like passengers on a ship when they wave at people as they go by the islands. Uh, these people lived and died. They never received uh, all that God has promised, but they never, ever gave up. Uh, and God was proud of them uh, because they looked to the future tonight. Listen, faith believes what it sees in the distance. I know my life is going to be different next year, the year following, and you know what? Even in the short term, next month, the month after that, that's what I believe. Uh, that's what's in my heart. Uh, that's, that's my mind. Uh, that's what's in my heart. Uh, that's what's in my mind tonight. Uh, that I know my life is going to be different because uh, my faith uh, sees into the distant. Let me tell you tonight, death cannot cancel the promises of God. Faith holds nothing back tonight. This is when Abraham offered his son Isaac on the altar, verses 17 through 19. This talks about or typifies the coming death and resurrection of Jesus Christ many centuries later. But he demonstrated uh, that faith goes all in for God. How many ever played poker? Let me see your hands. How many are still playing poker? Leave your hands. No. Uh... <laughs> we all want the all in moment. It's easy to go in all in for God when you have nothing to give Him. Does that sound bad? Okay, well, it is what it is. It's easy to go all in for God uh, when you don't have much to give Him. But when you have a little bit to give, it's a whole different thing. Because faith holds nothing back tonight. It doesn't. And it demonstrates uh, exactly what I'm talking about. It doesn't hold back the dearest, the most special that which is closest to our heart. He's offering his son as a sacrifice to God. We have a hard time offering a career to live for God. We have a hard time following through on a pledge. By the way, we're still operating under a pledge. If you would complete the pledge, it would really help us here tonight. Because faith holds nothing back. It always gives the dearest and the best. Faith tonight sees beyond the moment of death. That's Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, father, son, and grandson, who at the point of death looked to the future. Jacob blessed his son, Jacob his grandson. Joseph looked in the distant future and said, don't leave my bones uh, in Egypt. Uh, take my bones with you. In other words, tonight, Joseph knew that death could not cancel the promises of God. You may have done something 
that canceled a few things in your Christian life. You may have committed some things that you should not have committed and you feel like that kind of like canceled everything out in God's eyes. That there's no way God can reset the hand, if you will. Death tonight does not cancel out the promises of God. Because when a Christian dies, nothing of God dies. Listen to me tonight. There may be faith that's died. There may be hope that's died. You just can't see it really working out. There may be courage that's died tonight. But our God is a resurrection God, and death of any kind cannot cancel the promises of God. Faith tonight risks everything and gladly does so. This is a difficult place to get to in life. It's difficult to get to a place in life where you gladly risk everything. Like Moses' parents who defied Pharaoh's orders and hid Moses so he could not be put to death. They feared God so much they didn't fear the king at all. Listen, if you fear God so much, you'll have a hard time fearing your boss. You'll have a hard time fearing that money is not going to flow into your hands. You'll have a hard time not functioning if you fear God, because when you do, it makes it easy to live for God, because faith risks everything. Cultivate a godly fear. If I cultivate a godly fear, the fear of the things in this world that are going to come against me just kind of fade away. I'm almost done tonight. My goodness, 22 minutes. Faith refuses the world. That's Moses again. You can read in verses 24 through 26. Uh, that Egyptians fundamentally, <coughs> excuse me, did not understand uh, Moses. He was raised uh, in a foreign land, born in another land, raised in Egypt, raised in the king's house, all the Pharaoh's privileges. Uh, he knew the Egyptian language, the culture. He lived in a kind of a lap of luxury, and potentially he's going to be the heir to the throne. Uh, you know, he's in line. But he counted it all as nothing because he knew who he was and where he came from. This is important tonight. As a Christian, you need to know who you are and where you came from and never, ever forget that. You may get polished over the years. That's okay. We need to grow every way in our intelligence, in our skills, our ability to work with people. But you can never forget who you were and where you came from. Kind of like Daniel in a different place in time. Daniel couldn't be seduced because he remembered his heritage. We have a heritage here at our church. And for Moses, when the chips were down, he walked away from Egypt. He took up the cause of the oppressed people of God. Why? Because faith refuses the world. It's one thing not to get near the world. It's another thing in your mind to say, I refuse it. I'm not going to entertain something that's going to take me away from God's causes and His purposes. Why? Because I understand who I am, where I come from, uh, and my heritage uh, is important to me. And His name is written in Hebrews chapter 11 today. And I can promise you, if He became a Pharaoh instead of the man of God that He was, uh, His name would only be recorded uh, in some small archaeological journal somewhere that nobody reads. Faith separates the church from the world. The children of Israel, the Red Sea, this is in uh, Hebrews 11, 29, they experienced one of the mightiest miracles in the Bible. When they walked across dry ground, the Egyptians tried to follow them. Uh, God uh, flooded them with the waters and swallowed them up. Faith 
makes a great separation in the world. When you exercise faith, uh, God has this unique ability to cut a clear and wide path. So the world is over here, and we are right where God wants us to be. This is one of the many reasons faith uh, is so important today. Uh, today, it's hard to tell who has faith. As they say, you can't tell the players without a scorecard, but God knows his own. God takes note when you exercise faith when nobody's watching. When you decide, you know what, uh, I can get away with this, but I'm not going to. He takes note. God knows who truly belong to him. Faith brings down the walls of impossibility. This is Joshua, the people of Israel. They're walking uh, around Jericho for seven straight days. Uh, some absurd sight. Thousands of Jews marching silently around a walled city uh, and the priests rolling trumpets in front of the Ark of the Covenant. It almost sounds crazy. No way the walls of impossibility were coming down, but two words changed everything but God. These are two of the most important words in the Bible. Everything hangs on them. You know, everything can be against you, and sometimes I'll tell somebody, but God. Yes, come on. But God can intervene. But God can make a difference. God can change our, but God, uh, and this is what happened, uh, and it makes all the difference in the world because faith brings down the walls of impossibility and allows the but God moment to move. And those walls did come down. If you're backed in a corner tonight, and no one knows but you this evening, medically tonight, maybe it's financially, it could be legally, it could be a number of issues. Uh, listen, faith brings down the impossibilities in life. Faith redeems the unsavory past. That's a pleasant way of saying it. This would be Rahab the harlot, verse number 31. Uh, she had three strikes against her. She was a woman, she was a Gentile, and she was a harlot or a prostitute. But because she did something as simple as hiding the men of God that God asked her to do, uh, when the invasion came into the city, everyone in that city was destroyed except her and her family. Uh, because even in the midst of judgment, listen tonight, even in the midst of judgment, God will reach out and he'll save the lowest of the low. He'll say the brokenhearted. He'll say the one with just a teeny bit of faith tonight. Even in the midst of judgment. Sometimes people think God will get carried away and he's going to send this flood. No, 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 no. God knows the condition of the people's hearts tonight. And he knows you're this evening, heart this evening. And you may feel insignificant and small in life. And like you don't matter. God doesn't care. You burn God too many times. Listen, God reaches out and saves a harlot who turns to him in faith. Faith. faith empowers, this is the end, flawed heroes. That's like Gideon and Barak and Samson and heroes from the book of Judges. Gideon defeats the Midianites despite his fear. He was a coward. Barak defeated the Canaanites because uh, uh, he basically is forced into battle because of a woman. He still defeated the Canaanites. Samson defeats the Philistines, and he is the, one of the most morally compromising guys ever. Not a whole lot of admirable people. Which makes them pretty much like us tonight. If you think you're an admirable person, then you know. Maybe God can use you anyway. Hey, <laughs> let me finish. I expect... God's will. May 12, 1807, Robert Morris boarded a ship in New York City on his way to China where he became the first Protestant missionary. We are Protestants, by the way, in the great land. 113 days at sea, he arrived uh, on Macau, just there of, uh, of China. We were, my wife and I were in Macau for a while. Seven years after he landed, he baptized his first convert. 
He served as a missionary in China for 27 years, died at the age of 52. He wrote these words in his journal when he finally baptized his first convert. This is what he wrote. May he be the first fruits of a great harvest, one of millions who shall come and be saved on the day. God gave him the faith to see beyond one baptized convert in seven years. Do the math. Seven years for the first convert, 70 years for 10 converts. Today, there are more Chinese converts than members of the Communist Party. Today, they say there may be up to 100 million Chinese converts. My wife and I were missionaries in China in 1989. We baptized our converts in the bathtub. It was illegal to baptize them anywhere else. Even in 1989, I had a hard time believing what we do with work in communist China. We could witness, they could be saved, they could be trained, they could be discipled one day, they could pastor and do this. And I had the privilege in 2018 to minister in the leadership church in Guangzhou, China. And I walked into that uh, prayer meeting and with my eyes, because uh, us missionaries back in the day used to talk about, I wonder if this will really work here. And I saw Chinese men and women praying in the Holy Ghost in the prayer room. Amen. Probably 30 or 40 of them. Yes, amen. They ran every single aspect of that service. The pastor preached. They did everything. That congregation today is a church planting congregation, the leadership church there in the nation of China, and I got to see it with my own eyes. Uh, I wonder if Robert Morrison, uh, if God would give him a glimpse from heaven, what happens, because faith can see to the future tonight, church. It does. It casts hope for the future. So who's going to be the next hero of the faith tonight? Who's going to be the next one to respond to God's call? Who's going to stand up against the world? Who's going to stay, stay, step out? Who's going to march around some walls that are hindering you tonight? Who will risk the questions and the opposition from the world? Uh, who will be the next Abraham, the next Sarah, the next David, uh, the next Esther tonight, the next Ruth this evening? Who will give up the pleasures of the world for the sake of the cross?